I'll go on to cyber psychology, digital wellness, and digital equilibrium. And um, I'm sure everyone, I can see a lot of people have their phones on them, a lot of people are connected to technology, we're just talking about the app for the rotary. There's a lot of things that people use nowadays, and there's a lot of um, connection that we have. But we need more awareness of how technology works and why we think, feel and behave in certain ways and how to balance our technology use. And um, so for example, I wanted to talk about three areas where this is impacted. So we've got in news, um, we've got in health and we have democracy as well. So news, for example. Fake news spread six times faster than anything that's true, and these are the things that get tweeted the most. This is an issue. And then, carrying on from that, just after President Trump and his allies were taken off social media, 73% of the misinformation about the election fraud went down. 73%. That's like intense. And this just shows you the power that technology <coughs> companies have on getting whatever the information is out. It doesn't matter if it's true or if it's false, they just want you to see things. And then we move on to health. So for example, COVID at the moment has changed the whole world. And because social media is unregulated, it's able to amplify conflicting information and misinformation. And they do that by these algorithms that no one understands. Once you've created it, it's out of your hand. It just goes like chaotically sometimes. And the um, content that's designed to amplify whatever the attention is, no matter what sort of attention. And this is particularly prevalent on YouTube and Facebook. And this leads me to um, conspiracy theories, I'm sure you've heard about, and conspiracy beliefs. And that comes from a term called conspiracism, which is where you believe someone powerful and more malevolent you is orchestrating something. And these conspiracy beliefs, in particular about COVID, are used to explain COVID online. And they've fueled protests, they've fueled damage, and they've fueled violence. And a really good example of that at the moment is the Capitol Hill crew department. And these things in relation to global public health um, is seen as a global public health threat because it's inhibiting health-protective behaviours. Okay, so people are not once washing their hands, people do not want to wear masks, they don't want to do these things because they don't believe in it because of the misinformation they're seeing. And then we go on to democracy. Has anyone heard about Cambridge Analytica? Yeah, yeah. It's one of my favourite topics, so if anyone wants to know about that, we can do that. But they um, used personality profiles on a Facebook app that um, they paid some people to, to use it and to download and fill in some information and then it grabbed all their friends as well. So they had all this information that they were able to get legally um, about people. And from this they worked out people's personalities and what they would be more willing to interact with or react to. So two examples are conscientiousness and neuroticism and they're part of the ocean psychological sort of profile. And neuroticism was one of the biggest aspects. So for example, Cambridge Analytica played to these people's anxieties, played to the fact that if they were told something about all the international risks, that they would react. They would react in a negative way and they could therefore give the influence to make a different decision. So, and that, the decision that they wanted them to go to was that you need a strong, stable leader. So that was one of the advertisements that Cambridge Analytica was creating specifically for people that were high on neuroticism. Now you might think these tactics are a bit ethically ambiguous, which definitely they are, but they are now standard political marketing tactics, okay, in America in particular. It was used for Brexit, it was used for Trump, and it was used for a lot of other non-Western countries. And the target and the tactics are to sway undecided and anxious voters to a new political person that a lot of people are backing, or to not vote in a lot of cases. And there's no laws to protect any of this in the US. 
So they're just some of the reasons why I'm interested in cyber psychology. And cyber psychology is a new area that is grounded in behavioral science and human computer research. And it combines two of my favorite things. So technology plus psychology. And psychology is all about why we think, why we feel, and why we act in certain ways. And how these can be influenced. This is also important. And it's multidisciplinary, which means it's not just one discipline that is involved in it. So it's not just technology, it's not just psychology, but it can be a lot of other areas. And it's used in areas like cyberbullying, cybersecurity. So I just finished um, my psychology honors thesis last year, and I did it on um, humanoid social robots and how they interact with preschoolers. And um, I'm doing my PhD this year on behavioral change and technology acceptance in regards to autonomous vehicles and blockchain technology. So they're just some examples of you know, where you can go with cyber psychology. And I just wanted to talk about how often people are using technology. So the average smartphone owner unlocks their phone 150 times a day, touches their phone over 2,000 times a day. They spend almost three hours a day on their smartphones. And over your lifetime, you're going to be st spending five and a half years of your life on social media. 58% of smartphone users cannot go for one hour without checking their phones. And 67% of people compulsively react to their phone, even though there's no notification whatsoever. And once you pick up your phone, you have a 50% chance that you're going to pick up your phone again in the next three minutes. Does that freak out anyone else out? That, that starts like, wow, okay. So poor digital boundaries can turn your de device from a tool into a compulsion. And I really love this quote at the bottom. What it means to live well, have a fair and functional society, to meaningfully communicate and relate to others is now medicated through technology. One of the effects of this is people's autonomy, their ability to control their own time and space, to think and to understand. And all of this is under a great deal of pressure because of technology. However, a good point. Um, this overwhelm and more people wanting education and trying to understand how technology works. It's leading to people wanting technology balance in their life. And 63% of consumers try to limit their phone usage. 43% of workers are now turning off their phones to cope with distraction. And digital wellness is increasing in popularity with 60% of HR officers planning to increase the support for wellbeing and mental health this year. Digital wellness means an optimal state of health, personal fulfillment, and social satisfaction that everyone should be able to achieve when using technology. It's no longer considered a luxury in the workplace. It's an essential part of making sure your organization performs at its best. Digital Wellness Institute um, run a 10-week certification program. If you're interested in any of, any of that, you can do that. The next one's starting in May, and that's my code. I just did that in November, December. And then I'll move on to where I what things I'm working on now. And that's a term I've come up with called digital equilibrium. And this is a model I've created in relation to that. So it's all about balance. If you're not sure of the word equilibrium, it means balance. And it's one of my favorite words, actually. And so digital equilibrium is creating lifelong, healthy digital habits to thrive online and beyond. And as you can see from the little image, that it encompasses six elements, which all need to be understood and all need to be in balance with each other. And the idea of it is to identify imbalance, stressors, reactivity, and addictive and unconscious behaviors. And via this identification, you can then manage and change the negative and harmful digital behaviours into positive and healthy digital patterns. So that's the plan. 
And the ideas of how you would do this is an um, aspect that I call pause, consider, decide, um, and cost-benefit analysis, which I love, and um, thank you, and um, reflections. So they, they break up the six different aspects, cover digital literacy, which is all about understanding how digital stuff works, healthy boundaries and self-care, which is all about working out your boundaries, being able to express them and be able to put it into place. But then you have um, mindful and conscious decision making. So this is intentional technology use and making sure that you're using your technology as a device and not reacting to it. Then you have worthwhile communication. So it's an exchange of meaningful and relevant information. And then we have productivity and meaningful interactions and beneficial relationships. So productivity is all about efficiency, time and energy management, which is particularly important for people working from home. Meaningful interactions on mutual influences, which can lead to beneficial relationships when there's expectations between individuals. And um, remember, that the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it. And I like this as like a reflection thing. What am I what am I giving up to do what I'm doing online? What is what am I losing? You know, what am I actually gaining from this? And um, if you'd like to learn any more about this topic, I suggest the social dilemma, which is a documentary on Netflix. And I also suggest Tristan Harris from Humane Tech, and um, that's the um, they have a podcast called Your Undivided Attention and a Ledger of Harms. Also suggest for some um, research-based stuff, Demos in the UK and Data Society in the US. And if you want to read some books on this, Targeted and the book on the right are specifically about Cambridge Analytica. Persuasive Technologies from BJ Fogg, one of the, the creators of Persuasive Technology from MIT. And the Age of Surveillance Capitalism, a thoroughly researched, amazing book, all about how we are now the product of technology. So I hope you've learned something. The video will be on YouTube, the slides will be on SlideShare. Have a look at my Epicenter Equilibrium website. The digital equilibrium website will be launched soon, my Lee Chantel website, and VivaLivingHim.net. Thank you. Great. Please stay up at the front with, with me. Okay. Um, can I just say that was one of the best, most professional presentations okay. that we've had mm -hmm. at our club. Thank Just you. Another round of applause for our club. In, in my game, in the advertising game, pitching is part of our process. The way that you maintained our attention, engaged us, but also walked around the room, it shows that you've done this a lot of times yeah. before, but you've also obviously been coached or seen the best people. And you're using those tools to keep people's attention. And we're in the attention economy. You, you did a fantastic it, yeah. job, so I want to let you know you did a great Thank job. You very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, so, what I also want to just uh, say that is there, uh, I relate to what you're talking about here and, and uh, the one thing I wanted to share was there was an amazing campaign, it's, the, the brand name escapes me, but they took the insights from what you're talking about here about how much time people spend on things that are unnecessary. And it takes your time away from the things that are necessary, even more so the time you spend with each other. And they use the average age of what people are based on their ethnicity and their age that they are at that time. And they use facts and information like what we're talking about there. You add time at work, time asleep, time on your phone, doing things. They actually worked out. What if I was to tell you I only have one and a half years left with you, the time available that we have to talk to each other before we both die? Now, that information all of a sudden makes you think, what am I doing mm. spending time on these other things when I should be spending time putting my phone down or organizing and catch up instead of putting it off? Yes. And that's when you attach the emotion mm. 
and meaningfulness to something, it then creates movement and change. So you're doing a wonderful job. Obviously, there's something that drives you, something at some stage of your life made you not only invest heavily into veganism, but also this stuff's powering you day in, day out. What is that drive? Um, I'm here to change the world, really. So, <laughs> so you know, it's pretty simple. One tomato at a time. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, the veganism, the environmental stuff, the feminism was my thing for years, and this is my new passion. So, you know, um, it comes, there's a few different things that come and go as I evolve or whatever, and yeah, this is my latest one. So, and I think it's just really important. Because we're so attached to everything, and especially because people don't understand it. And I think, you know, oh, we just educate people about all this information and then they'll change. But I know from my psychology training that it's, you know, behavioral change is very, very hard. And it's like comes down to social norms, a lot of it too. So I know it's a lot of work, but, you know, I, I have the ability to get stuff done. So. Yeah. Good. Mum and Dad must be proud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What do you think? Did a good presentation? Yeah. Very, very good. good. Yeah. Very good. James, you're impressed? Yeah. Thank you for inviting Lee Chantel in today. It's true. Uh, any and, questions? Uh, what's that? <laughs> yeah, questions. She, she, she's happy to start questions. Yeah. Are you Let's do some questions. questions. Now, you can start the questions, Matt. I know you're heavily invested in psychology. It would have been really interesting for you. Yeah, yeah it was, absolutely. Um, a <coughs> lot of questions. Uh, one on the, the two questions on the, on the vegan. Uh, is I saw a documentary that while we in the West are cutting back on meat, in China and India, as the middle class gets gets um, they get more wealthy, they want they want the they sort of, they view that as what you know the yeah. Western lifestyle. Yeah. That's yeah. that's number one, which seemed to be a little bit different to the information you had there that China was going the other way, but anyway. That, that's that, more to do with the culture. Now. Okay, right, yes, but, that, but yeah, that's, that's what true. I saw, so that's number one because you've got two billion people, whatever, hundreds of millions of people going the Western way. Uh, the, the, that's a worry, but my question is on the animal, you said on testing, uh, is that including medical research? Yeah. Right. So yeah. You, you're against uh, mice and so yes. forth being yes. tested on. Yes, they're not. They don't have anything that relates to humans. So it's 2021, you know, and um, we've got a lot of a lot of stuff that needs to be tested. Like say the COVID COVID vaccinations at the moment that mm -hmm. needs to be tested on humans before you know that it's safe. And there's a lot that aren't even up to that sort of stage. And there's a lot of new ways that you can test on things. There's a lot of like. Um, studies that are done without animal testing. How, how do you feel about um, the embryonic stem cells? How do you, if, like because some of it's coming from Where are the embryos coming from? Aborted fetuses. Yeah, well, it's not really a big issue, so right. um, I, don't, okay. I don't really have a thought about that to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Any other, one last question? Not question, questions or? later. No? All right, well, round of applause for Lee Chetel. Thank you so much.